Welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning. You have been with us uh, for a whole module, um, a module that was introductory in nature, a module that dealt with uh, various aspects of nature that were of particularly of contemporary interest, for instance, like international English, um, the globalization of English, world Englishes, uh, the rise of cultural studies, etcetera. Uh, we are now in the second module and in fact, this is um, you know the second lecture in uh, this module, the first lecture being of uh, a general intro, uh, you know uh, introductory in nature sorry. And uh, this lecture is entitled Old English. Now, this may be today um, for many of you, you know, only of a certain historical interest or for some of you maybe to just uh, get by in understanding uh, the development of English from the time of the Anglo-Saxons. In the first module, uh, we had a lecture entitled the English language, in which many of the things that uh, we or some of the things at least that we are talking or going to talk about in this module uh, were already addressed. What we do today is look at uh, the beginning of the English language and you would be those of you who are not yet acquainted with it would be uh, really surprised to see how different the so called old English was uh, from uh, when compared to uh, even uh, you know early modern English or modern English or contemporary English or Englishes as we know them today. Okay. You uh, have learned by now uh, at least this that English belongs to the Indo-European group of languages. Uh, in uh, the lecture on the English language, we had uh, you know dealt with some of these um, uh, pieces of information. Okay, and today let us look uh, if only not uh, you know if only at uh, from a, a curiosity. Okay, from a historical curiosity, historical linguistic curiosity about the English language and its uh, sort of its antecedents, right. So, uh, welcome then again to um, what I hope is going to be an in interesting module on the development of language that is used by so many today. As always, let us then look at the uh, texts that are going to be with us uh, throughout this essay and I must say that I uh, am looking at some of the more well established texts, okay, texts that were uh, that are still uh, today you know used as uh, textbooks in uh, particularly in uh, undergraduate English major okay, um, English major um, courses in different parts of India and also abroad. The first text is and I am sure many of you are acquainted with the name of Professor Alfred Baugh, A. C. Baugh's book, The History of the English Language, which has by now been through several editions. Uh, Simeon Potter's beautifully written Our Language, published by Penguin Books. And I have also included an edited, a volume edited by Indrani Kosh, entitled A uh, uh, History of English Language, a Critical Companion. So, as with so many of my lectures, what I am going to do is I am going to bring in extracts okay, from um, these books uh, so, you know, and then explain those extracts as we begin to talk about uh, the phase of English known as Old English. Fine. Uh, despite uh, you know, a few differences, okay, a very, very minor um, uh, almost trivial uh, you know uh, differences in date it is usually um, an established fact today that historically we uh, uh, we uh, ascribe the period from the middle of please look at this slide from the middle of the 5th century okay from the middle of the 5th century to the middle of the 12th century okay as um, the time or duration of the kind of English that 
um, we call old English today. Okay, so it is from the fifth century to somewhere around eleven hundred and fifty. Okay, the twelfth century that uh, we call the time or the period of old English. Okay. So, this is what we had also seen earlier. Let me again look at this, so that we can place um, the different um, um, historical phases of the English, the development of the English language. Old English 5th century to 1150, Middle English from 1150 to 1500, Modern English is post 1500. For some would also, some also add a, an intermediate stage before modern English known as early modern English. Okay? But uh, we can it is safe to say okay, that these are the three phases of the English language and its development. Now, you also um, came across this that the original uh, inhabitants if you can one can today use such a term the inhabitants were uh, before the coming in of the Anglo Saxons it was uh, the inhabitants were the Celts okay? and the Celtic language please look at this sli slide the Celtic language uh, will be divided into Gaelic or Gaelic and Cymric or Britannic. Right? So, before old English proper okay, we had the Celtic language. Now, if you ask uh, someone okay, what is old English. So, how do we characterize old English? One of the first things we have to say of course, is that it is it belongs uh, to a sub branch of the Indo European language and the sub branch is known as West Germanic. Okay? Uh, in fact, if uh, you know it is said that the that uh, old English okay, the old English phase of the English language is similar in many aspects to to the German language to modern German okay, compared to modern English. So, uh, it comes from West Germanic uh, as a language and the period please look at the slide the period from this is very important a very important historical event or a series of events okay, the period from the arrival of the Anglo Saxons. This is a term you need to learn immediately. Okay. The Anglo Saxons, the coming in of the Anglo Saxons into, um, into this island. Okay. So, the period from the arrival of the Anglo Saxons in Britain to the Norman conquest okay, is usually seen as the old English period. So, what was the first way in which we first in the first um, kind of taxonomy we had used what? We had used um, dates. Okay. We had said that from the 5th century to the middle of the 12th century is designated the period of old English. And now, we uh, you know uh, we look at that the, the, the designation of the period from uh, the point of view of two conquests, okay, two important conquests. So, the period from the arrival okay, of the Anglo Saxons in uh, to Britain to uh, its conquest okay, or to her conquest by the Normans. This period is known as old English. So, the Latin words the next point Latin words brought by the Anglo Saxons and words from the Celtic language of the Celts intermixed to form old English. So, just a while ago remember we knew we learned that there were two, two varieties of the Celtic language and then with the coming in of the Anglo Saxons okay, we had we can now, in a very general, uh, general way, we can say quite safely say that old English contains words from these um, uh, uh, these tribes, if you may use the word, European tribes that came into Britain and the already existing Celtic language. Hence, Latin words brought by the Anglo-Saxons and words from the Celtic language of the Celts intermixed to form Old English. Now. If you look at this slide, if you look at the map of modern England, right, today's England, you would then say that, or the United Kingdom, sorry, you would say that uh, this this old English was prevalent in most parts of England and in Scotland in the southern and eastern parts. Okay, so England and the southern and eastern parts of Scotland. 
uh, or where we, we uh, would have found the old English language prevalent. So, let us then uh, look at uh, remember Simeon Potter's book the um, uh, on English on English language uh, is a seminal text with us and let us see how he mentions okay, how from where we get an idea of old English and he points to one work in particular. Okay. He says I am quoting him our knowledge of it that is of old English is derived from the ecclesiastical history from this word okay, ecclesiastical history of the English people which was written in Latin by the venerable Bede about 730 nearly three centuries after the first Jutes, Hengis and Horsa landed at Ebb's fleet in the Isle of Thanet in, four, in 449. Okay. So, this uh, the ecclesiastical history of the English people is an important source of our uh, knowledge of old English. Now, when we, when we talk about the Anglo-Saxon conquest, okay, uh, we refer to three different tribes that invaded um, England. Okay. These were the Jutes, the Saxons and the Angles. Okay. So, the Jutes came from Jutland or Jutland, the Saxons from Holstein and the Angles from Schleswig. So, these this is known as the Anglo-Saxon conquest, okay. the Jutes, the Saxons and the Angles. Um, the important other important factor here is also you know the Romanization of uh, Britain, okay, the Romanization of the island. For instance, A. C. Baugh says that uh, uh, regarding the introduction of Roman ways of life, by the third century Christianity had made some progress in the island and in 314 uh, bishops from London and York attended a church council in Gaul. Next, he says about the introduction of Latin in Britain, Latin did not replace the Celtic language in Britain as it did in Gaul. Its use by native Britons was probably confined to members of the upper classes and the inhabitants of the cities and towns. On the, on the other hand, Potter say, has you know, uh, this information to give to the English intruders, the Celts offered neither friendship nor culture and little by little the latter were driven westward. Okay. So, we find that you know the Celtic resistance uh, to it was limited and as Potter mentions here, okay, they offered neither friendship nor culture and little by little the latter that is the Celts were, di were dri more driven more to the western part of the island. We know that most of England and the southern and eastern parts of Scotland are where the um, uh, in a way uh, the, old, the old English phase um, of the English language is today accepted to have been uh, extant. Then Bo goes on to say about the con conquest, many of the Celts undoubtedly were driven into the west and sought refuge in it's very important Wales and Cornwall will still still find remnants of the language. Okay. Many of the Celts undoubtedly were driven into the west and sought refuge in Wales and Cornwall. In any case such civilization as had been attained under Roman influence was largely destroyed. The Roman towns were burnt or abandoned and that is why uh, from the point of view of a civilizational change if we may put it not simply a conquest okay, a territorial conquest, but also a civilizational uh, that is why you know this period is extremely important. Okay. It was a civilizational change that came over with the giving um, you know the sort of giving way by if I may use the word by the Celts and the destruction of uh, you know the Roman influence. Okay. It marks a very important or it is a very important landmark in the history not only of the history lang uh, of the lang uh, um, history of the, the English language, but also of um, history in the island in general. So, 
uh, what were the three tribes? They were the Jutes, they were the Saxons and they were the Angles. Okay? So, do you know where the name English or England comes from? Okay? Out of the three obviously, you would understand, you would guess that the word has its roots in the Angles. Okay? So, the names England and English. right? The writers in the vernacular call their language English with, with, with this spelling. Right? English is derived, the word is derived from the name of the Angles and England which is called Anglerland or Anglerland, see Angles from Angles, Anglerland or later Englerland. Okay, from which is shortened to England. Right? So, the name England is derived from derived from uh, the, uh, the tribe or uh, the conquering tribe uh, called the Angles. So, the word is derived from the name of the Angles. England that is the land of the Angles was formed around the year 1000. Okay? This, um, this again this um, uh, the year uh, 1000 is generally accepted. Okay? It is not that there are no other uh, you know scholars who claim probably uh, um, a different date near, uh, near to this, but for, for general purposes we accept uh, the year 1000. Right? The English language that we use today is a result of this is an important word fusion okay? is a result of the fusion of the dialects spoken by these Teutonic tribes who had come to England. Right? So, it is it's a fusion of several dialects which are going to we are going to look at. Right? Um, you know, an important point here is also regarding you know the so called purity of language. Right? The, the even you know speaking from a political angle from a cultural politics angle okay, you cannot really say that any, any a pure there is a pure in any language is pure without being sort of you know quote unquote contaminated by another language. Okay? Uh, the English language itself began as a fusion. Right? We know there is a Latin influence, the Celtic influence okay? and uh, the influence or the coming in of the Anglo-Saxons. The basis of the study of Old English right, uh, on which it is um, you know uh, this, this other part we are going to look at a little later. The basis of the study of Old English are the manuscripts that have been found in the West Saxon dialect and forms this forms a major part of Old English literature. Okay. A bit about the literature, you can skip this slide for now. Now, it is important to know that there was no one variety okay, of Old English. There were it is today recognized that there are four, it is accepted that there are four, there were four dialects okay, or variants of old English. Now, I know we know that the word dialect today is of, of course, contested and dialects are today claimed to be languages. Okay. So, the, uh, nevertheless this is how we look at it uh, from the conventional point of view and with this lecture and the other lectures in this module when we finally, down to modern English um, is you know, I am going by the conventional way in which this has been uh, accepted and I am not really getting into the politics of the history of uh, you know the English language. We dealt with a lot of that in the contemporary times that way are you know the, the debate is more dense, there are many Englishes. Here in this module, I am generally following that I mentioned in the beginning um, such texts as A. C. Baugh or uh, ones by A. C. Baugh and Simeon Potter. Okay? This is the accepted history, and hence I'm using words like dialect, right? So there were four dialects of Old English, okay? And these are the Northumbrian dialect, okay? The Mercian dialect, right? The Kentish dialect, and the West Saxon, right? Look at this: Northumbrian, Mercian or Mercian, West Saxon, and the dialect from Kent, right? So these were the four four variants. I may use the word of Old English prevalent during the time. So, what are the characteristics then of the English language during the time of Old English? Okay? So, the basically I mean very basically here really the characteristics of Old English may be enumerated as follows. One is of course, a very different, very different pronunciation. Okay? 
So, first point is regarding pronunciation. The pronunciation of Old English words okay, differs or differ from that of their modern equivalents. Their absence, there is an absence of those words derived from Latin or French and is a, is a relative absence and the grammar Old English is synthetic, but modern English is an analytic language. Okay. So, what are the three characteristics of uh, you know Old English which uh, it is not that there are no other characteristics, but what you would you know uh, for one of the first things you things that you would notice at least is that the pronunciation and the script are very different from uh, the, the English that we use today. Okay. In grammar okay, there is a distinction of number singular plural and case and grammatical gender was not dependent upon considerations of sex. For instance, Mona Moon is masculine, Sun, sun is feminine, Maiden girl, Wif, wife, child are noiter, while, while Wifman, woman is masculine sorry, because the second element of the compound man is masculine. So, this is another you know in case of gender, there are several differences that we find from modern English. Then I will quickly read through the, uh, the other features which are uh, you know important as we study old English or look at old English. The two fold declension of the adjective, the strong declension used with nouns when not accompanied by a definite article for instance God man or good man. Then there is a weak declension used when the word noun is preceded by an article for instance the or say good God a man or the good man. Then the personal pronoun is singular dual, okay, it has singular plural and, an, and a dual form right, that we do not really use today and the presence of strong and weak verbs. Now, coming to old English literature, the, the literature of the Anglo-Saxon period in England okay, is considered to be a very rich literature. Right. As Bohr mentions, the literature of the Anglo-Saxons is fortunately one of the richest and, and significant of any preserved among the early Teutons. Okay. And this is a text, so look at this slide, this is a word or name title of a text that many of you are familiar with. Okay. The text is Beowulf, I don't know if you can see this properly, B E O W U L F, Beowulf. Uh, there is also the seafarer, then Kidman, Kidman's hymn, okay, the tragedy, the wanderer, and translations that took place under its very famous king, known as King Alfred. So, if you get a question like a uh, name, okay, name uh, a few or name a couple of important important texts of Old English literature. So, you would you would first, of course, mention. Um, uh, mentioned Beowulf, they talk about uh, Kidman's hymn okay, among others and also refer to translations that have taken place under King Alfred. Now, this is um, I have actually taken it, this has been taken from the Wikipedia, I must acknowledge this here. Uh, look at the script of Old English. Right? Now, if you look at the script here, and if you look at the spellings and there is nothing here I am sure that you are will be able to read. Okay. This is an instance or this is an example okay, of old English its script and uh, you know gen in general its language. Right. So, this is how old English looks like. Then I have also taken this from uh, uh, the Wikipedia which is uh, if you look at uh, the lines, some lines from Beowulf, okay, uh, from the poem Beowulf. Look at this is the language. This is language in which it has been written. That is Old English, okay. So if you look at the what, this is the corresponding modern variant of that, okay. Then this is another version, right? If you look at King, right? This is again, these are again other some other right, so, uh, some other uh, examples from Beowulf. So, as you can un, uh, the, you know realize obviously, this is an English that surely neither you 
nor I or any anyone who is not familiar with um, old English or trained in reading of old English. In the reading of old English, we are never going to be able to uh, to decipher this kind of a script or language, right? So, what then let us go back again to the Celtic inference. What did we learn in the beginning? We learned that the variant on the language, there were two variants um, or two types of Celtic that were used um, during just before the coming in of the Anglo, Anglo Saxons and the Jews. Okay? Uh, so, there are certain words from the Celtic language okay, that have remained. Uh, with us, it's not that uh, you know um, we don't have or that the Celtic language is found only towards Wales or Cornwall. Okay, there are certain words that have remained. For instance, Celtic place name. Then I'm going to go through this list here. If you look at the slide, um, Celtic place names like London, York, Kent. And that's from Kanti meaning unknown. Okay, so these are the names that have remained, and from there are certain words like come a deep valley in names like Duncombe, Tor, High Rock, Peak in Tor Hill, Tor Cross, Tor etc., and the names uh, with Celtic, uh, uh, you know, with with Celtic roots. For instance, Celtic rivers are Thames, Avon. X, Dover and Y. So, you can Im imagine the two most famous uh, words really when you look at England. Okay, London and Thames are uh, you know from Celtic and other they are the other Celtic loan words for instance, bin, basket or crib, brock or badger again come a deep valley and tor which we have already talked about. So, this whole thing about you know this whole um, issue about the purity of a language or that a language is Anglo Saxon at the time and it comes only from the influence of the language of the Anglo Saxons and Jews is really a uh, misconception. Okay. In every language really in the world, you will find remnants of the previous languages okay, and uh, in different parts of a single country, you know, you will find that in some areas there are the influence you know of more of the of the old language that was there okay so there's a lot of variety in the, even if you look at old english okay then the latin influence uh, there was an acquiring of a considerable number of latin words evidences of a long roman rule and additional latin words that were acquired by the celts the reintroduction of christianity by roman missionaries resulted in an extensive adoption of latin elements so, also the Latin elements uh, are uh, which were taken you know earlier acquired by the Celts have also remained and characterized some uh, uh, you know some parts at least of old English. Now, uh, regarding these borrowings uh, let me quote from A. C. Bohr's book the history of the English language. Bohr says there were thus three distinct occasions. Okay? there were thus three distinct occasions on which borrowing from Latin occurred before the end of the old English period. And it will be of interest to consider more in detail the character and extent of these borrowings. Of course, since A. C. Bohr's uh, work, a lot of work has been, uh, has been done, a lot of established work uh, of course, on this influence okay? uh, and particularly mentions three dis distinct occasions uh, of uh, occasions where Latin was, you know, was, uh, Latin had an influence to uh, which uh, happened before the end of the old English period. Regarding the Latin influence, again, the Latin influence of the second period is the introduction of Christianity into Britain in 597. And Bohr says the new faith was far from new in the island, but this date, okay, this date. 597. This date marks the beginning of a systematic attempt on the part of Rome to convert the inhabitants and make England a Christian country. Right? And this you can refer here to uh, the mission of St. Augustine, then the uh, general philosophy okay, of the Teutons and the preaching of Christi, uh, active preaching of Christianity. Now, the influence of Christianity 
okay, the influence of Christianity on the vocabulary. We find that Latin borrowings of the second period that we, uh, you know, of the com of Christianity can be divided into two groups. Uh, phonetic forms that show early adoption and are found in literatures from the time of King Alfred and words of a more learn, uh, learned character introduced during the religious revival that accompanied Benedictine reform. Right? So, now for instance early borrowings that we can refer to which have stayed in the English language are church, uh, the word church itself, bishop, then words that survive. Uh, of, uh, are all, uh, also in uh, the words that may be included are abbot, disciple, epistle, hymn, temple, names of articles like cap, sock, silk, purple, chest, mat, sack, words denoting food and plants for example, beet, call, lentil, millet, oyster, dough, plant and mallow. Again, Regarding education and learning, school, master, Latin, grammatic, verse, meter, miscellaneous words like anchor, fan, spelter, elephant, etcetera, and learned or literary words like circle, lesion, consult, and talent. So, this is the influence of Latin. So, these are you know some of um, for really an, uh, for a beginner for an introductory course, uh, this is enough to know about old English. And uh, what I will do now by in, you know instead of a recap, I will uh, try and initiate a, you know a question answer sort of a section okay a discussion and uh, from our brief discussion on old english for instance what are uh, the most important points which can uh, come to you in the in the form of a question okay we uh, if you are asked uh, what is the generally accepted date okay for or period or duration of old English and you would say that the old English period phase of the English language uh, is supposed to be from the 5th century and particularly the middle of the 5th century to the middle of the 12th century okay? and the precise dates are of course, 5th century to 1150 that is the period of old English. right? And again what were, what are the three generally accepted periods of old uh, uh, of uh, the English language in general, the history of the English language, these are what old English, middle English and modern English. And we also um, have mentioned that uh, early modern English is also a phase that is added by historians. Right? Then the next, uh, the next question uh, we may ask is um, what is the sub branch, okay? what is the sub branch of uh, old English? Okay, we know that eventually English comes obviously from the Indies and it is an Indo-European language, it falls into the Indo-European group of languages, but what is the its sub branch that uh, you know we can refer to old English the, it comes from from West Germany. Okay? And uh, the next question would be uh, you know if we do not look at dates from the point of view of historical events, okay, which are the two important landmark events, right? Which sort of uh, you know uh, encapsulates the uh, old English period, and then you would say that the, the there are two important events, okay, which mark the beginning of old English and the end of old English, and these are the Anglo-Saxon conquests of the island, and on the other extreme uh, extreme is the Norman conquest, okay. Following that again, the next question is what who were the Anglo Saxons? Okay? The Anglo Saxons you know are uh, you say uh, uh, that are a group of marauding tribes that invaded England and these were the Jutes, the Angles and the Saxons. Okay? Now, if you get the question like where does the word England come from? Okay? The word England comes from the word name of one of these tribes, which is the Angles. Okay, and uh, we first had Angleland, then Englandland, and finally England. So England owes its name to one of these three tribes, right? Then um, the next question is: um, if we have to, you know, uh, if we have to identify those areas in which old English was most prevalent, okay. which are the areas, you know we before that we know that 
the the language extent was extent was Celtic. Okay, but we also know that Celtic came to be more or less replaced. Okay, replaced by uh, Old English and uh, the Celts, as I uh, was mentioned by I think A. C. Ball, Simeon Potter, that the Celts offered neither friendship nor culture, and they sort of migrated towards the western part. Okay, so then the answer would be England. Okay, more of what you know most of what we call England today and the southern and the eastern parts of Scotland. Okay, this is the area that we may identify today as the area in which old English was most prevalent. Then for instance, you may uh, you know if you are asked a question like what are the dialects of old English? Okay, then the dial there are four dialects. Uh, of old English and these dialects are North Umbrian, okay, Kentish, Mercian and West Saxon. Then what when, when you when you are given a script of uh, old English, what are the things that you are going to immediately mark or what are the things that in immediately come to your attention as being very different from modern English. Of course, our uh, you know uh, 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 are the spellings and the pronunciation of the script. And remember we had seen a script from Beowulf, one of the most important uh, perhaps the most important Anglo-Saxon text and we found how diffi difficult it would have been for us without any training to understand those words. Okay? So, the grammar is synthetic while modern uh, English is analytic okay? and you also find the absence of French words. right? Then also you find as far as uh, um, number is concerned, okay, you find the presence of not just the singular and the plural, but also of something called the dual. Right? Then uh, another question uh, may be posed to you is name uh, two, most, uh, two of the most important uh, texts from old English literature and we may cite the example of Beowulf and Kidman's hymn. Okay, as the two most important texts from old English literature. Then uh, what, what uh, are the names that have remained from Celtic from or from Celtic influence okay, which are important words today and we know that these are place names or names of rivers for instance like Avon, like Thames, place names like London, York, Kent etcetera are from Celtic and words like Cumb or uh, Deep Valley and names like you know uh, beginning with Tor for instance, Tor means as you know a peak or a high rock. So, you have Tor Hill, Tor Cross etcetera. Okay? And uh, one of the you know final questions would be about the Latin influence. Okay? The Latin influence particularly came uh, is evident even today and it was also in those uh, even today the words like you know uh, words that came from ecclesiastical practices okay? words like for instance a uh, church okay? words like church um, words like bishop right hymn temple epistle about disciple uh, names also of articles like silk sock uh, names of um, names denoting food like beet for instance plant mellow etc then we also have words coming from education and learning like school master uh, the word latin itself grammatic etc and these are you know for um, for uh, a, a course that is introductory in nature for you know to that is being taught in English uh, in sorry in engineering colleges and IITs in, uh, in India. This is um, according to my um, um, uh, you know in uh, according to my thinking this is enough for us you know to be to be acquainted with old English literature. Okay. And in the next class, we are going to look at the next phase, which is called the Middle English phase of literature. Okay. Thank you for now.